Good morning. Thank you all for joining our last webinar of the year, Sibling Relationships. I've got Kate Meyer here from Ensemble Therapy, who will share everything about siblings and the relationship and um, be able to answer questions with you all as you have them. Yes. Hi, my name is Kate. Um, I was trying to figure out how to share that audio and it's still not going to let me. And that's okay. It's just a cute little song that I thought would kind of kick off a sibling rivalry. Um, and it's that song where they're like, anything you can do, I can do better. Um, so today we are going to talk about sibling relationships, which oftentimes means sibling rivalry. Um, and so what we're going to look at here first is me. Um, so my name is Kate. Um, I have a couple different things that I do currently. So I am a licensed specialist in school psychology, which means basically I'm a school psychologist. Um, and so I do psychological services within the school-based setting. And I work primarily in private schools, but I also do independent educational evaluations um, for different school districts. Um, I am also the parent coordinator and coach at Ensemble Therapy. And I do the executive functioning coordination as well. Um, I am a parent. I have three kids myself. And so you'll get to see some pictures of them today. Um, they're adorable. And then um, I also was a teacher prior to moving into this role as a school psychologist. All right. So if you guys can type into the chat kind of, ages slash stages that your kid or kids are in so that I can speak to that. It will help me kind of um, make the, evalu or the evaluation. Obviously my brain's doing one thing. Um, make the presentation a little bit more catered. Okay, so second and sixth grader, 13 and 10, okay, 11 and 13. So more on the, the older end this time, it's interesting. It's interesting to me what different, the different presentations bring. Okay, eight and six, and then a two-year-old. Oh, we have a pretty similar split. I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a two-year-old. Okay, 11, four, seven, okay. First grader, second grader, okay. Okay, this gives me a little bit of a jumping off space. So, all right. What we're going to talk about today is we are going to be using um, this book. It's called Siblings Without Rivalry. Um, it's a great book. Um, I'm going to summarize most of it for you today, so I'll save you the, the time in reading it, but it's a fantastic book. If you ever are suggesting a book to somebody else that has siblings, it's an old one, but it's a good one. Um, so we're going to be articulating the different dynamics that siblings bring into the home. Um, channeling that rivalry into more positive relationship building experiences and how to communicate clear family expectations that increase those favorable behaviors that we're all looking for. Basically hey, how to, oh. You're not sharing your screen yet. Are you ready to share? Oh my gosh, I thought I was. Oh, it said you disabled the participant screen sharing. Maybe that's why I got bumped off. Okay, go ahead. Can you see it now? Yeah, there we are. Thank you, okay. my lady. So, um, okay. So first, that the other parts were just the intro parts and they just had my picture. They weren't, they were just cute slides, but not important, clarify that. Okay. So first we're going to talk about that sibling relationship. Okay. And the sibling relationship is a really powerful one. Um, it really impacts our early life. Um, if you are a sibling, you know what I'm talking about. If you see your children growing and changing with each other, you also know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they, that sibling relationship can produce the most intense, like feeling positive or negative. Um, nobody knows how to push my buttons better than my sisters. Um, and you know, that those feelings can really persist into adulthood as well. Um, 
brothers and sisters can teach you those strong social skills though. And we know that. Um, we see them teaching each other those skills, not always in the best way, but that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but they really learn how to resolve conflicts and carry these skills into their entire life. Um, sibling relationships do change over time. That's something to be mindful of. The way that they are behaving right now while they're all living in the house, if they're teenagers versus how they're going to be behaving when they're adults and are living in separate homes is two very different relationships. Um, the other thing that I often suggest when talking with families is that we really need to stop focusing on making them friends. Okay. That's like forcing somebody in the home when they're super stressed around someone, we're like, and you're going to be their friend. Not only do you have to be kind to them, but you're also going to be their friend. It doesn't always work. You're not always friends with your siblings. You might be, um, but it might not be until you're older. Um, really our job as parents is to equip them with the skills that they need to have these caring relationships as they grow into adulthood. Okay. Um, the other part too, is that, um, we really need to stop focusing and helping them stop focusing on who was right, who was wrong. Um, we're really going to talk today about how to move past those components. All right. So this is, you know, my little like funny thing about how, like, this is kind of how I thought it would be. Um, these are my oldest two, my first one and my second one. And this is like, you know, that day in the hospital and it's picturesque and she's holding her and kissing her. But in reality, it's much more like this on a daily basis. And even though they're much older now, this is still kind of how it looks. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about those sibling relationships, but before we get into the nitty gritty of like how to, I do like to talk a little bit about the research because there's a lot of really cool sibling research that has occurred um, and about how siblings impact each other. So some of the things that we know is that age difference and gender play a really big part. If the siblings are born more than about six to seven years apart, in a lot of ways, they're essentially only children. That is if they don't have one in between, um, that in between middle child kind of, we look at all those different spaces. Um, gender also really plays an important factor, okay? We have different studies that have shown that individuals with a sibling of the other gender express higher levels of romantic competence. Um, other work has shown that boys with older sisters tend to endorse more egalitarian gender roles, maybe because they grew up with a female peer who was always stronger and faster. Um, also studies have shown that younger siblings teach empathy to their older brothers and sisters. Um, and when we look at the percentages and amount of time that kids are spending with their siblings, especially, you know, coming out of this COVID pandemic time when they were really intensely spending a lot of time with each other, um, 82% of Americans with siblings spend their early years interacting with each other far more than anybody else. Um, Siblings who report feeling close to one another tend to both either graduate from college together or drop out together, which is very interesting. Um, they do it often as a unit. Um, we even know the best sibling arrangement. It's something called XBS, which basically is the code for the oldest child, doesn't matter what gender they are. So the placement is X. But then when there's a brother that's within two years, um, then the next sibling is born five years after and it's a sister. That is the quote unquote, according to the different research that I found, best arrangement. Um, and that when they say best, they mean like highest educational um, or economic attainment. Um, that is not the, the breakdown in my family, um, nor the breakdown with my kids, but um, if it is yours, congrats, um, you know, research is on their side. Um, the kind of downside is uh, also that sibling relationships are definitely the most violent relationships between family members, um, which means that there's a lot of roughhousing and we know that and we expect that. Um, but there's also that um, more siblings report bullying um, than with their, their older sibling than any other relationship. Um, and we know that that sibling aggression can be harmful for kids, especially if it's frequent or if it's inhibiting them from doing um, daily activities. And so this is something to be watchful of as a parent. And we'll talk about fighting too, and talk about those different levels and stages of it, because there is 
different levels and stages of fighting. Um, and this is that very aggressive, consistent and constant. Um, in 2016, scientists um, definitively announced that second children are pretty much the same as everybody else. So we didn't have to lock them into those um, roles anymore as the second kid being wild child. But then a couple of years later, an MIT study came out saying that they're more likely to end up in prison. So I think that that is to say that there's a lot of research going on, a lot of different indications occurring, and we just have to do the best that we can for our children. Um, there is also limited um, evidence that talks about um, adversity helping bringing siblings together, um, like after a period of divorce, which is a very stressful time for everybody involved. Um, some cases, siblings become closer, um, but it's not always, uh, it's not a consistent ratio that we're seeing. It sometimes that brings the people apart. Um, the other thing that can compound the difficulties in siblings relate, sibling relationships is definitely parental favoritism, whether it's perceived or actual. So that's something for us as parents to be aware of. All right. So the first step in working with your kids on those different relationships is really allowing them to say the bad feelings that they're having about their sibling. So often we as parents move to the negate role with that when they're like, they're the worst person in the world um, or I hate them. You know, it's hard for us as parents to hear our kids speak that way about each other. And so oftentimes we move into the, don't say that about your sister. You know, that's not a kind thing to say. We use kind words in this family. Um, but really, you know, they didn't choose to live together. Um, you know, we, as parents, you have one. And you're like, gosh, you were so cute and delightful. I would love another. Um, and so, or, or a variety of ways in which you decide to have another child or a surprise by one. Um, but it is to say that it's not something they chose and they're being forced to live with this person and forced to share the same resources. And so there is that natural competitiveness. So allowing them to really express those feelings about their siblings, um, it's okay. It's okay for them to do it in a way that is not hurtful or harmful. And so I put here some ideas, but we're going to do some practice because practice makes perfect. And so I've got some examples of how to really work through this um, with your kids and then some examples for you guys to trial. I will also give Dana a PDF of this. And so when she sends out the copy of the recording, she'll also have this PDF link to that. Okay. And so this will kind of, if you're like, oh my gosh, that was really great, you know, um, but I want to practice this later or practice this at home or wait till this comes up and then remember what I want to say. So the first part is instead of dismissing those negative feelings, acknowledge them. So an example would be like, you're always with the baby instead of saying, you know, no, I'm not. I just read to you. Um, what you can do instead, instead of negating is say, you don't like me spending as much time with her. And so what that does is that helps your kid understand that you hear them. Um, this is something that all kids are really um, attuned to when they feel like they're being heard, but especially the teens and preteens, they very much want to be heard. You're not listening to me. You never listen to me. Um, you know, the other thing that we can trial is giving into fantasy. Um, what isn't always reality. This works really well with your younger kids, like basically lower elementary and below. Um, you know, and you can do this and be as fantastical as you want, but that'll sometimes get them to pop out of that frustration feeling. The other suggestion, and this is more of a therapeutic suggestion, something they would do if they were in therapy is basically allowing them to channel those feelings, you know, like if they really want to hurt their sibling, um, and you can get in front before that fighting or anger occurs, like, show me what you want to do with your doll. Like, like, Oh, you know, and that works really well with younger kids. Um, the other part is really helping them show how to like really helping show them how to discharge those angry feelings, those feelings of like intense frustration, like I just want to, you know, blah, um, by helping them talk it out. Like you sound so furious, but I expect you to talk to your brother without calling him names, um, and really focusing with them on like how to discharge those so that when they have that same situation in school or with a partner, that they'll know how to discharge those feelings of intense frustration because it'll occur, but not as often as it is being elicited with that sibling. 
Um, so like I said, I'll give you that time to kind of practice on your own independently rather than during the presentation, just so we have more time for questions at the end. Okay, the next part, and this is so hard for us as parents, is really to just resist the perils of comparison, okay? Instead of saying like, um, you know, anything that's in relation to the other one, like, God, your sister puts things away so much better than you, or why do you always lose your water bottle? Your brother never loses his water bottle. Instead, do your best to describe what you see, describe what you feel, and describe what needs to be done. And if you can keep it that concretely and keep it away from that competitive, like, you know, your sister or brother does this so much better, um, or even in the reverse for the favorable, like, gosh, you are the best in the whole house at doing this. Um, you're so much better at your sister than your sister is at blank. Um, really helps them foster that independence and that self-worth rather than a comparative, which when there's a lot of comparatives going on, then there's going to be more fighting and more bickering because it makes it more competitive in your household. Um, and so kind of like I just said, those favorable comparisons, like you're such a, you know, instead of saying like, you're such a big boy, you don't leave things lying around like the baby. Um, say what you see, you know, I see that you picked up your blocks and your truck and you even put away your puzzle pieces. And so you can see how different those two things are going to be perceived as by the kid. The kid in one situation is like, I am better than my brother. Like, I'm so much better. And then the other situation is like, I am good at this. Yes, like I can do this. Um, and the unfavorable one too, you know, that we spoke about. And so I put some examples and things to practice that you can say. Okay, I love this picture. I know most people have seen this, but I really think that it is such a good visual to show kids and adults, hence why it's in the, the presentation, um, about equality um, versus equal. So you can see in one situation here in the first picture, that's equal. They all have the same thing. Everyone has got an equal box, okay? But in the next one, that really shows us how equal doesn't work. And how instead, what everybody needs is to be able to see over the fence. And so some people might need two boxes and some people might need one. And some don't even need any supports at all. And this is the way it works with our kids too. You really have to focus again, away from that comparative language on what do you need? What do you as a person need? Um, and so this is, you know, when you kind of shift that focus away from treating your children equally and focusing onto those unique personal needs, it'll shift a lot of that fighting and comparison as well. It also really makes me as a parent feel better because I'm like, what do you need rather than I'm giving everyone four of that. Um, and so it's the same thing with love. It's the same thing with support. You might find that one of your kids needs you to show up at, you know, lunch and volunteer and be a lunch monitor because they're having some big behavioral issues. Um, and it might not be what your other kid needs. It's just focused on what does that kid need and what are you as a parent able to give? So I put some different examples of like the different kind of situations that typically come up. And so the first one is time. Like that is, um, you know, a tough one. And it also comes with materials as well. So it might be that you're like making breakfast and you're like, you gave him more pancakes than me. Oh, okay. So are you saying you're still hungry and you need more pancakes? And then oftentimes that'll like the first couple of times they're going to be shocked because they're like, I don't know what I need. I just saw what he had and I wanted it. Um, and so then eventually it's like, I need this. Um, you know, if you're using like a positive reinforcer, like someone has a behavior chart at school and you focus on like ways that you can help them, um, you know, and it might be that they get to go do a special thing. And then the other one's like, well, I want a special thing. And it's like, oh, do you need a special time with me after school too? And they're like, yeah, I do. And so it's okay to say, I need something special with you after school too. Um, the other thing is time. This is something that we see with, like I mentioned with toddlers a lot, like you're spending so much time with the baby. Are you saying you need some more time with me too? Yeah. Um, it might also happen if you have a big sociological change, like a divorce, or you're bringing in a new partner into the family, um, focusing with your kids on what do you need? And if they don't know how to express that, they can only compare it. Then that's your job as a parent to help them reword it. So if they're saying, well, they have this, 
Okay, so let's talk about what you need. So the next part is siblings and roles. This is mine when they were much younger. They don't allow me to put my their pictures in my presentations anymore. So these are younger ones. Um, but focusing on these sibling roles. Okay. So, so often I think we as parents get into this comfort space of like, oh, you know, June is just my brave one. She is so brave. Or you know, oh, like he always has trouble with teachers at the start of the year. Like, gosh, John just has so many issues with them. Um, and so then the next part is really looking at, um, sorry, I just heard a bang on my window. Apparently my dog is ready to come in. Um, but the next part that we look at is like with our conversations with others as well. So when you're talking to your friends or you're talking to your in-laws, making sure that you're not using that role language. Like, you know, yes, they have shy moments, but they also have brave moments. Just like we as people are very multidimensional. Sometimes I feel really brave and sometimes I feel really shy. And sometimes I feel very organized. And sometimes I feel like things are a dumpster fire. You know, it's just dependent upon like the day we're having or the mood we're having or what we're doing. And our kids are just like that. They are not one dimension they have multi-dimension or multi-dimensional. Um, and so making sure that you're really not limiting that. If you tell someone over and over that they're your shy, special boy, then they're going to be your shy, special boy. But if you tell them that, you know, I can see that you're feeling very worried right now. Okay. That's okay. You can feel worried. You can take your time getting warmed up to go into this birthday party or this big, you know, intense thing. That's okay. That's the moment that you're in. So how this is seen oftentimes too in siblings is like, we've got our aggressor and we've got our victim. And typically your aggressor is your older one and your victim is your younger one. And so focusing with them, you know, on clearing up that language and not just saying like, gosh, you're always so aggressive or even giving that label to them. They don't need that. Like, why are you always such a bully? Um, and focusing on like, you know, this is what I, you know, using that same language as before. This is what I want to see. This is what I do see. This is how I feel. Um, or what do you need? Making sure that language is focused on those things, not necessarily those labels. Um, because, you know, they get enough of those labels all throughout the day. But like I said, making sure that you are not treating one as the victim, even if, you know, the older one is being aggressive to the younger one. Then going in and saying like, I know you are a really kind kid. You look like you're having a hard moment. Let's talk about it. Um, and we'll talk again, like I said, about fighting in a minute. So more along those lines, if you can tell, I'm trying to be really push this one into home is like really focusing on not having one kid that's your bully or your aggressive one. Um, but, view, but viewing instead of it being a problem kid what problems do they need solved? And this is something that we talk about a lot in the school-based setting and as my role as a school psychologist. Kids don't try to be mean. They don't try to be bad. They're trying to figure it out. And sometimes they're trying to figure out what mean is and how far I can push someone. And sometimes they're trying to figure out what's okay and where's the line and what boundary do I have here? Um, so really helping understand their frustration. So you seem really frustrated. And then appreciation for what they have accomplished and then help in focusing on those solutions. Because a lot of times kids don't know how to solve it. If you think about these, um, you know, kind of already worn in grooves and relationships that these siblings have, almost like, um, like a mountain with a ski run, um, you know, there's a lot of grooves. Um, everything's really worn in. That's exactly what we've always done. My sister does this, and then I do that in response. This is our little role that we play. Um, but instead, try to think about these changes that we're talking about, almost like, like a fresh coat of snow. It's not going to work every time because they're really used to these ways that they have always done things. But over time, with your support, they're going to start to realize I'm an individual, and this is how I solve problems. Or this is my family, and we're a cohesive unit, and this is how we solve problems but they might need some help in focusing on what those solutions are. 
Um, and so the way that I kind of tweak this was focus, instead of focusing on their disabilities, focus on their abilities. So if the kid says, you know, that was too fast, um, you know, instead of saying, be careful with that ball, you know, your sister's not very strong. You could say like, Hey, you almost caught it. And that was a really fast ball. And so you can kind of see how different that language is and how in one piece, they're like, I know, like I can't catch it. And they're always throwing things really fast at me and I can't do it. And why do they do that? And then the other one is like, yeah, I did almost catch that. I am amazing. Um, and so really focusing as a parent, how powerful your language is and how much change you can evoke in what you say and how you interact with your kids. Okay, um, the next part is fighting. Um, I thought the picture of the kangaroos was kind of funny. Um, so fighting is something that always comes up. This is, um, you know, every single time I talk to parents of two kids or three kids or more, they always want to talk about how do I stop the fighting? It is incessant or sometimes it's okay, but then other times it just goes on and on and on. I feel like I'm dealing with it all day long. Um, so, you know, first I think, like I've already said before in the presentation that using that language, changing the way that you're speaking with them, focusing on them as an individual, focusing on the need-based language really helps dissipate a lot of that competitiveness and fighting. So I do think that over time of you utilizing that kind of language with them, you're going to find, oh my gosh, they are really fighting less. Um, but when they do fight, what I typically suggest is, um, so you've got different levels and stages, like I referred to earlier. And so the first one is just that bickering, the normal bickering that occurs. Okay. And that's the kind of thing where they're just like, meh, 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 meh. you know, it's almost like puppy dogs fighting and wrestling, you know, they're testing each other, they're figuring it out. Um, but it's all like, you know, if you stepped in and tried to solve it, it'd be one of those situations where you solve it. And then like two seconds later, they're playing together or two seconds later, they're fighting again. Like it's just that low level bickering. Um, the next level is when you're like, Ooh, like, okay. Like this is starting to heat up a little bit. Um, that, that just turned and you can hear it because someone's voice will raise or someone's stance will change. Um, or someone will, you know, start to cry and you're like, okay, this is, beyond our usual bickering. Um, and that's when you, as an adult can go in and just, um, kind of think of yourself as a therapist, reflect those viewpoints. Okay. So, you know, June, you just said that you don't like it when your sister goes in your room and takes your clothes without asking. Um, and don't offer any solutions. Don't offer any supports, just reflect what you hear them saying and see them saying. And sometimes having you in there as the parent will help that situation go back to that low level bickering or maybe even dissolve it. Um, and sometimes, you know, things might continue heating up. Um, and if that's a situation and it gets to that, like almost dangerous, um, phase where you're like, Oh, this is about to go physical, or this is about to, about to get a little ugly, um, remind them of your rules in your family, whatever those rules in your family might be. And if you don't have any rules in your family, then a good way to introduce that is we'll talk about it in a minute as kind of a family problem solving meeting. But in our family, you know, we have a rule that we do not touch each other in an aggressive manner. Um, so saying like, remember in our family, we do not use our hands to hurt. Um, and then offering up some alternatives. You look, I can see your fists are clenched. You look really angry right now. Um, why don't you go into your room and you can punch your pillow? You know, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, if you have something that they can hit or punch or push, you know, sometimes when kids get into that space, they get very dysregulated. And so they have a lot of sensory needs that come out and they just need to push something heavy or be tightly squeezed or go jump on the trampoline or go, you know, kick a ball against a wall really, really hard. Um, and so they might just need to expel that. So offering up some alternatives for them in that moment, because when it gets to that level of possibly dangerous, it's not about the fight anymore. It's about that they're dysregulated. And so you got to help that situation cool down. Um, if the situation gets into that definitely dangerous zone, then separate them. That's your time when you go in, if you can separate them and separate them. And then describe what you see. 
you know, I see that you're on your sister and you're pulling her hair and she is crying very loudly, um, you know, and help them separate, help them regulate. Um, and not always do the problems need to have a solution. Um, and I'm also talking about kind of like your best case, like best practice scenario. There is times when I am trying to get out of the house and I have to get to work and they have chosen, not chosen per se, but they're fighting. And I'm like, I cannot use my best, most kind methodologies and work through my different stages of this. And so it's not always going to be perfect, but this is what you can try to attain. Um, the other part with the ignoring of that, like low level bickering, a lot of times they'll want to come and tell you and bicker out around you. Like you're often, I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes for me, I feel like it's when I'm cooking like, um, dinner, it's like that wicked hour for some reason. Um, and so I'll be trying to cook and they're like, so-and-so did this and then they did this and then they did that. And, da, 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 da. and I know that they aren't really needing me to solve their problem. What they need is to figure it out. And so sometimes it's just that that one's in a bad mood. And so she's super annoyed by that one. And that one is knowing that that one's in a bad mood. And so she's picking at her. Um, and so in those situations, just you can decide what you want to do. You can just straight up ignore it. And then and they'll be like, why are you ignoring it? Blah, 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 blah. Like, blah. And if they say that, you can give them an answer and say, well, I'm busy cooking right now. I can't focus on that. But as soon as I'm done cooking, I absolutely can focus on that. And at those times, I'll often use like my phone or a device. I'll say, why don't you record what's going on into my phone? And I will listen to it when I'm done cooking. And oftentimes by the time I'm done cooking, it's not an issue anymore. Um, or by the time they listen to it, they're like laughing about it. Like, that was so funny. Remember when you said that? Um, the other thing is you can do like an empathetic listening, like, hmm, mm hmm. Um, but the bickering, you know, the less you involve yourself in it, the less they will involve you in it. Um, if you constantly are getting involved in that low level bickering, they're going to go to you to solve that every time. Um, so starting to hand off that bickering level to them as much as possible. And so this is those different examples that I'll send you guys in the PDF, um, you know, and using that language too. Um, oftentimes when kids get dysregulated enough to turn into a physical fight, it's, you know, well, depending on, depending on your level of tolerance for it, but it still is upsetting seeing one of your kids hurt another one of your kids. Um, and so I often like to kind of rely on this language. Like I see two very angry kids right now. It's not safe for you guys to be together right now. Um, but really focusing on, um, helping them understand, um, where your lines are as a parent, because different parents have different lines. And so maybe you're okay with like wrestling on the ground. Um, but another parent is like, ah, like clutching their pearls. Like I cannot imagine that that's no, that's not okay. Um, it is often a gender line. Boys are more physical with each other than, um, girls, but not always. Some sisters are quite physical. Um, okay. The other thing is, um, when they do have that physical aggression um, moment um, or you walk in or so-and-so is like, they bit me, you know, um, making sure that you first give your attention always to the victim instead of immediately turning to the one that did it and be like, why did you do that? Why would you hurt your sister again? You know, um, focusing on like, oh my gosh, are you okay? Let's get you an ice pack and attend to that child. And then you can even encourage if the one that did the aggression is ready, like, hey, can you please go get the ice pack for your sister? Um, we need to get ice on that, on that bike as fast as possible. Um, you know, I don't know. I chuckle because I'm like, that's exactly our situation was last weekend. Um, but you know, it's important for them to to realize like even when you do something that you regret, it's important to take actions to help that person or to make it right in as best of way as possible. Okay. So sometimes parents will say like, well, we don't have any ground rules. Like, I don't know what to say to them when you say, remind me of the rules. Or sometimes parents will say, and this often, hap often happens with like the teens um, or late elementary, where it's like the same fight every single day. And you're like, I'm going to pull my hair out. Why are we having the same fight every single day? What is happening here? 
And so that's a time when I would suggest using this kind of like problem solving methodology. And this is just something that's stolen from the classroom. So they should be used to this um, kind of way to solve a problem. And so you can call a meeting if you have something, if you already do family meetings at your house, then that's great. You can incorporate it into that. If you don't, and you're like, what is a family meeting? How do we do that? Um, a family meeting is just that what it is. It's, it's a meeting as a family. It's a meeting as a family without any devices, without any interruptions. Some families like to do it on um, like Sunday evening dinner because it's a typically pretty calm time. And every member of the family is there. If you have something to discuss, sometimes like we'll utilize our family meetings for like, hey, we have this trip coming up. We need to talk about, you know, what you want to do on the trip, or we need to talk about what to pack. Um, it's a way for you to give information to your to your family members um, in a way that's not like on the fly, like, hey, don't forget, we got to pack for that trip today. Um, and so with the problem solving kind of methodology, if you will. First, explain, you know, the ground rules. And this can be the same for your family meeting as well. Like only one person talks at a time. We're respectful listeners when the other person is talking or, um, you know, we're going to write down all ideas. We're going to be respectful, different things like that. Um, whatever family rules work well for your family, um, but being respectful to each other is a key one. Um, and then write down, if you have something going on, like um, and the problem solving ones can be the most mundane things, or they can be really big. Like one of our problem solving things was it was clothes stealing, you know, one sister was stealing the older sister's clothes and it was just devastating her. It was breaking her, um, which, you know, to me, I'm like, okay, like, I don't know why it's a big deal, but we're having the same fight every single day. So we're going to address it in a problem solving method. And so writing down their feelings, like, oh, I feel so hurt when you steal my clothes. Um, you know, and well, I love your clothes. They're all nice and new, um, you know, and then allowing each kid that time for rebuttal, giving them that space to express themselves in a calm manner. Um, it does get heated sometimes and then we just calm back down um, and then writing out solutions because that's the key, right? Like this problem has come up numerous days in a row. What is our solution? Um, and so writing down the different ideas, even if they're just bananas and if you, you know, like six-year-olds, for some reason, they make the most bananas ideas. And I'm like, that's crazy, but I'll write it down. Um, but I don't say that's crazy to them, obviously. I love that out of the box thinking. Um, and anyway, so writing all the ideas down without evaluating them and then deciding on solutions you can live with and then writing it out and posting it. Like if they share a room, post that in their room on the mirror or next to the mirror you know, from now on, blank, 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 um, whatever the steps are, you know, so-and-so will ask her sister. If her sister says no, then blank, you know, whatever the situation can be. And then follow up in a day, in a week. Hey, you know, we talked about this and this is what occurred. How's that going? Um, you know, cause that makes them feel like they were heard and that their problem was addressed and it often really helps dissipate. Now I wouldn't say go through this whole like rigmarole for a problem that's super, you know, minor and only is fought about a couple of times. These are the ones that like, and one parents that have older kids are probably no, but like the ones that come up all the time and it's like repeated same problem. Um, all right. And so I put an example in here that you'll have in the PDF as well, okay? So this is just, you know, kind of our summarization of what we've been talking about um, and focusing on, again, to kind of reiterate some parts, like making sure each child in the house feels safe in the house and feels safe in their personal body um, and that they're taught to express this frustration and feelings and whatever they are in a very safe way and also a comprehensive and cohesive way as much as possible for young kids. Um, just making sure that we as parents are really valuing the individual kid and we are not locking them into any role or saying like, you know, you do this this way or you're my, you know, special brave kid. Um, and then making sure that we give them the experience and guidance every day. Cause like I said, at the beginning of the evaluation, this is how we are teaching them to be adults and how we are teaching them to live in this world. You know, you're going to have someone that annoys you a lot at your job. It's just going to happen. And you're going to have to figure out how to solve problems with them and work with them. And you're going to have someone that's kind of mean to you. And you're going to have to figure out how to solve problems and work with them. And so thinking about 
when they're having those sibling fights and relationship difficulties that you're teaching them lifelong skills and how lucky you get to teach them those skills in your home, which is your safe space. And very frequently, because it's going to come up again and again and again and again, all the fights. Um, so some other ways to make sure that you um, are giving them, you know, kind of like that encouraging those good feelings between siblings, which again, like I lulled when I put that, that one in, get it growing up solo. Because um, anyways, so I suggest having date nights. This is something that if you talk to it, any person and you're like, I'm having like fighting between the kids or, you know, like, I feel like, you know, this is going on in our house and there's any sort of frustration or conflict. Oftentimes the solution from the professional will be spend more time with that kid, which if you have more than one child is hard in itself. And if you are working or you're a busy parent, I mean, it's hard to find that time. And so I'm not saying when I say date night, like, you know, plan an extravagant night that you have to take time to think about. I'm just saying like, if you have an older kid, let them stay up 30 minutes later than the younger one and watch a show with them or play cards with them or just, you know, eat a fun treat late at night. Like it can be anything. You have, you know, a younger kid, it can be going on a walk while your older kid is at home or maybe taking that time and sitting outside with them and, you know, drawing chalk or whatever it might be. Um, these date nights don't have to be fancy and they don't have to be, um, you know, like anything that takes an extravagant amount of time. I just having that time with them one-on-one -on -one is crucial, especially if you're noticing an uptick in, um, behaviors like frustration behaviors. When you are spending time with that one kid, don't talk about the other one. Just leave them out. You're there. You're focusing on one kid. Okay. The other thing is, is if you have a kid who you are liking more right now, maybe the other one is just frustrating you like nobody's business. And so one of them is being really sweet or delightful. You don't have to withhold your affection or anything like that from them. Um, Cause then that can create some negative um, feelings as well. So just making sure that, you know, you are really working as a parent to give your kids the attention that you you're able to, that you're feasibly enough, like have enough time to give them, but also that it's, you don't have to withhold that affection. Um, it's, it's okay. Um, make sure that you really, like I said before, don't lock them into that constellation of their, their family role. Your first one is not always your most responsible one. Your middle one is not always your most wild one. Um, you know, and then making sure that each kid um, has the opportunity to experience some of the privileges and responsibilities of the other ones. So oftentimes this happens when your oldest kid goes on a trip with a family member or to camp and your younger one gets to step into that role and it's really fun for them to experience um, and vice versa. If the younger one is gone and the, the older one gets to have more of that, um, you know, different roles and responsibilities, it's, it's often very fun for them. Um, making sure you don't get trapped by togetherness. Okay. So making sure that you as a parent are able to know that there are times when you are going to be more together, but to allow time for freedom and separateness, especially if you have a kid that is in that more middle or high school range. Um, even late elementary is when they can start feeling like that. Um, sorry, just a minute. My dog is barking. Um, the other part is making sure that you, I'm going to pause for just a second and close this window. Sorry about that. The joys of being at home for the day. Um, the other part is letting each kid know what it is about their siblings that they admire. We do this in the classroom setting all the time. We have compliment cards or we have spaces where they can write down, you know, any sort of thing like, I like that so-and-so does this and do that within your home setting too. Like make a little card for them in one of your family meetings and say like, let's write down one thing that we love about our sibling or like, let's write down one thing that is super special. Um, and then put it on their door. It feels good to hear good things about yourself. 
um, especially when it comes from your sibling. Um, we already talked about family meetings. Uh, the other part is letting them play, like letting them have unrestricted playtime. Oftentimes we schedule things so intensely, um, whether it's sports or school activities um, or our own work schedules. And so it's really hard to allow them to have that free time. Um, and sometimes it feels like there's too much free time, especially in the summer. Um, so obviously it's a balance, but if you're noticing a lot of bickering and you're noticing that you have a really packed schedule, try to find some time for them to play. And that might be if they're younger, imaginary play. It might be if they're a little bit older, you know, video games together, or even if it's them sitting on their separate devices, you know, in the same area, um, that might be, it might be all you get, but letting them have that time together that's unstructured is really important. The other part is being an example to them, um, modeling the behaviors that you hope to see from them. And so being very explicit and clear with your own sibling relationships, if you have that to tag off of and say like, you know, um, like, gosh, my, you know, like if you get into a disagreement with your sibling, like, yeah, I'm really frustrated with them right now. We're taking some time to cool off right now or showing them the positive sides, like, you know, calling if you need a sibling to do, you know, to do something for you, because we often rely on them for that as adults, but, you know, oh, they're really reliable. I know I can call them and ask them to do this and they'll help me. But be an example as a person when you're demonstrating those different relationship pieces. And then that's it. That's the, that's the whole kit and caboodle. Like I said, I will um, send Dana the PDF of all of those practice sheets so you know exactly what to say um, or at least have some sort of guidelines and maybe tweak some of the way that you're using that language with your kids. Um, Thank you, Kate, for that information. Yeah. Do we have any questions from you guys? Does anyone have any questions for Kate? As I said earlier, I did record this session and it will be sent to you via email and I'll add the PDF that Kate has included. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this is our last Lunch and Learn for the year. We will have another schedule for next year. Um, it's once a month or once every six weeks when we have those holidays in between there. And um, you guys will all get some information on that at the beginning of the year with our sessions for next year. If you have any sessions you'd like to see, please send me an email. Um, it's Dana Wilcott at Pflugerville ISD. Um, I would love to, to be able to bring whatever it is that you guys need um, to you. If there's no questions, I will stop recording. No questions, okay. Thank you all for joining us and we're almost done. So enjoy the rest of the year. Mm -hmm.